Amen. Amen. What a privilege and an example to us all. What a privilege. We're going to turn to God's Word now um, and hear it read, um, and then we will hear from it. And this morning we're looking at Habakkuk. We're in our series of Habakkuk, and we've got to chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 4, and that should be on the screen behind me. Habakkuk 2, starting at verse 4. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as shale. Like death, he is never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awaken whom will make you tremble? Then you will be spoilt for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnants of the people shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the stones will cry out from the wall and the beams from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. <coughs> Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness you will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and the violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them, What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver and there there is no breath in it at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let's pray, and then we'll turn to God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, be with us now as we look at your word. Lord, help us to see the reality of this world. And Lord, help us to look upon your judgment as a good thing. Lord, help us to ultimately see your plan more clearly and see the Lord Jesus and to give him glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, how do you feel when you watch the news? When you listen to stories of companies not paying the taxes that they should? Or of people taking advantage of young people? I watched a YouTube video this week about country lines and people taking advantage of others. Or of innocent people who are abused. Or of powerful countries pushing against weaker countries. How does that, how does that make you feel? Does it, does it make you frustrated and angry? I think we often hope for justice, don't we, in our world? When, when, we, when we look at the news, when we see all the, tro- all the atrocities that happen in our world, we hope for justice. We want a world where the guilty are judged and, and, when, and where justice reigns. 
but instead we end up living in a world where injustice seems to reign. And our world often seems unfair and unjust. Well, last week we were introduced to this wonderful book of Habakkuk, which really centers upon this dialogue between Habakkuk and between God. You see, Habakkuk, he, he has this great burden. He watches the news at 10. He, he sees what's happening out in the world. He sees the evil and the atrocities of everything that's happened, and it is like a burden to him. But also, he looks around him. He looks in God's people, and he sees evil as well. He sees that actually people are not necessarily living for God. And he questions God. He says, God, if, if you're a holy God, if you're just and true, then why does it seem like you're sitting and watching this happen? Why does it seem that you're allowing this to happen? And God responds. And, and we're excited, right, as God responds, because he's a God of justice, and surely he's going to talk about how he's going to bring justice. But actually what we find is really interesting because what God says to Habakkuk is he says he's going to raise up the Babylonians and he's going to raise them up in order to discipline his people and to bring them back to him. But Habakkuk, Habakkuk's so, so kind of frustrated and confused by this. Why on earth would a good, holy and true God raise up an evil nation in order to discipline his people? How can God both be good and true and just and yet still work through evil? And God's response is that Habakkuk is to wait patiently because actually God's plan is going to be revealed. And God is going to bring justice. He is going to bring justice on Babylon. But Habakkuk is to wait. He's to wait until this plan is revealed. He is to have faith in God. And Habakkuk was told to wait patiently. And we've had to wait patiently, although it's only been a week for us. But we've had to wait to see how God is going to bring justice to the Babylonians. How God is going to bring justice to those who do not do evil. And that's what we find in our passage this morning. We find God's response to evil in this world. We wait to see how he's going to deal with this problem of evil and sin. And as I said, this book is a conversation between Habakkuk and God. Each of them are responding to one another. But actually what we find this morning is we get to listen to just God speaking. And God speaks about how there is a clear distinction between those that live for him and those who have turned away from him. We see that from, from verse 4, don't we, which we, we looked at at the end of last week. God speaks about how the righteous shall live by faith. God's people are to have faith in him. They are to follow him. But there also are people who have turned against him. Look at verse 4. Before his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him. You see, God specifically here is talking about the Babylonians, about this nation that was going to come and take God's people away into captivity. This nation that was going to ravage his people. They are an evil nation, a sinful nation. They are puffed up. They are not upright. We read more about them in verse 5 as well. We see that they are as greedy as the grave. The grave never is full, is it? We see that in our lives. Wouldn't we love it for the grave to be full? For the grave to turn around and say, actually, I've had my fill. I've taken enough people. But no, the grave continues again and again and again to take people. And that is just what these Babylonians are like. They're never tired. They're never full. They're an evil nation who at the time were going around the world and were destroying other nations, other peoples. They were evil. They despised other nations. And yet God says that there is judgment that is going to come on them. There is judgment that is going to come on those who are evil and unjust in this world. And what God does in, in many senses here is he pronounces these woes, and he actually does it through, partly through his people. 
But we see in our passage today that there are five different woes that God pronounces on them. Now, woe is a kind of strange word, right? It's not maybe a word that, that we use very often. But essentially what it's talking about is it's this idea of God and God's people pronouncing judgment on evil nations. Of saying, these are the things that you are doing that have, you have turned away from God. And there is a judgment that is coming. Because Babylon was guilty. And we're going to see that through the five woes this morning. So we're going to go through each of those woes in turn. Don't worry, they won't be as long as our normal points because there's five. I know, we need to get back for lunch. But we're going to see how actually Babylon had turned against God in all of these different ways. And the first woe that God and God's people give to Babylon, to this evil nation, is that they are plundering other nations. They are plundering other nations. You see, Babylon were, were stealing and they were taking from these other nations in order to grow their wealth. It was part and parcel of what they were doing in this empire. They would turn to those who were weaker and they would extort them. And in many ways, God echoes the cry of Habakkuk in verse 6. For how long? How long is this evil nation going to go into these smaller nations and take everything from them? How long are they going to take the, the very little that they have and take it away from them and actually build their wealth up? How long is this injustice going to continue? But actually, immediately as we see this woe, we have this beautiful picture. Because God and God's people know that God is a God of justice. If you look down at verse 7 and verse 8, we see immediately that actually although these Babylonians, although these people are plundering others, there will be a day where they are plundered themselves. There will be a day in which there is justice. There will be a day in which those who have been oppressed actually will be free. And those who have oppressed them will be judged for their actions. Babylon will pay for their sin. And actually we have the benefit of looking back through history. Although Habakkuk was in a very specific time and he was told to wait and see how God was going to fulfill what he was saying, we have the benefit of looking back. And we see that although the Babylonian Empire was an evil empire who actually trod on weaker nations around them, eventually they themselves were turned and were punished for what they did. Their empire didn't last. The evil that they had in some way was judged. The woe that was pronounced on them was fulfilled. But there's an interesting thing that happens, I think, as we look at these woes. Because these woes are speaking about a set time and a set place. They're speaking about Babylon, about this idea of this nation or this people who were plundering other nations. But as we sit here now, in the 21st century, we read these words, and it should really bring to mind the idea that actually this isn't just Babylon. We see this in our world, don't we? We see that people are making money off the poor. We see that nations are taking advantage of weaker nations and poorer nations to use them to build up their own wealth and their own gain. We see countries making sure that the order of things is maintained so they can continue to be rich and to prosper, but whilst other nations are oppressed and trodden on. We see, yes, that this happened in Babylon, but we also see that this happens today. And, and surely for us in this world today, we, we cry out for justice, don't we? There might even be people sitting in this room who have come from countries that have in some way been plundered and oppressed. And you actually even feel this even more. But all of us, whether we watch the 10 o'clock news or we read a newspaper or we go onto Twitter, we see that our world isn't the way that it should be. And we cry out for justice. We see these powers and these empires, these countries that are plundering others, and we say, that isn't right. And we long that there might be some justice. And what God is saying here, as he pronounced his woe, is he says that there will be justice one day. And that should make us happy, shouldn't it? As we cry out for justice, we should be happy to know that God is on the side of justice. 
He declares that it will take place. You see, because the reason Babylon was plundering other nations was for their own glory. But God was going to punish them. And we actually see this idea of them working for their glory in the second woe. Verses 9 to 11. Woe to those building for their own glory. You see, this Babylonian empire, at the time, they thought they'd never fail. They thought that they'd built, and we see this even in the the metaphor that's used in this, they thought they'd built their nest so high that there was no way that it could ever fall. They thought they were impenetrable. They thought that there was nobody who could threaten them. And in their pride, they preyed on the vulnerable and the weak. And God says they are guilty for that. Because in a sense, there's, there's nothing wrong with wanting security and to be safe. But the Babylonians, the the Babylonian Empire, was doing this at the cost of other nations. They were making sure that that their own empire was built up. But they were killing and destroying other nations to make sure that that happened. And actually, it's really interesting, isn't it? This idea that that is used, that God speaks about in verse 9, about building this nest on high, we actually see it in Scripture, Some of you may have immediately flicked this as we had this read. But actually back in Genesis, we see this happening, don't we? We see a people deciding they want to make a name for themselves. We see a people saying that actually they want to be like God. We see a people who are on the ground looking up to the sky and saying, actually, we want to be up there. We want glory. We want a name for ourselves. We want to be known throughout the whole earth. Babel, Genesis 11, verse 4. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. People trying to get their own glory, to take away glory from God. The people wanted to be like God. They wanted to take his place and have their own fame. Back in Genesis 11... What was that city called? Babel. The Tower of Babel. You see the link? Babel, Babylon. That's actually the first first introduction we get in Scripture to Babylon. We see that this nation has continued its ways throughout Scripture, trying to build up their own name, trying to build up their own fame in order so that they might be like God, so they might not worship him, but instead that they might be worshipped. And surely those days are over though, right? Surely we've, we've stopped doing that today, haven't we? 828 metres high, 200 floors, the Burj Khalifa stands in Dubai. And written on the wall in the building are these words. From the earth to the sky. From the earth to the sky. Let me, let me read that again, what, what we read in Genesis 11, verse 4. They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. We see this, and it's not just the, the Burj Khalifa, because in some ways, yes, it's, it's brilliant that we should be building with architecture, but our world is a world in which so many people are seeking their own glory, They are seeking to have glory instead of God having glory. We we are metaphorically trying to build up our towers so that we might reach the heavens, so that we might be in the heavens ourselves and then be praised. We are saying, actually, God, we don't want you in glory in the heavens. We want to take that place ourselves. And what was true from the very start of the Bible with the Tower of Babel to the Babylonians in our passage here to in our modern days today is that man tries to steal glory from God. We try to make ourselves like God, but God says that there will be justice because those that build empires in evil ways, they will actually forfeit their lives. Verse 10 says that. They will forfeit their lives. And that isn't necessarily in this life, although sometimes it is, but it certainly will be in the life to come. Because you see, Babylon is trying to build a name for itself. It's trying to seek glory instead of giving glory to God. And that's explored more in the third woe. Woe to slave labor. Verses 12 to 14. You see, the Babylonian empire, it was built on slavery. 
These cities built by forced labor, and their whole kingdom was, was really with a foundation of oppression. Oppression of the weak and the vulnerable. But look at verse 13. God says, behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire. You see, God has this promise that although this nation of Babylon has built its empire and its buildings from slave labor and oppression, one day that will be burnt down. One day all the things that they have done and all the atrocities that they have committed and really the glory that they try to make for themselves, it will all be dust and rubble and ashes. Because what one conqueror builds up, the next conqueror tears down. We see that through history, don't we? I've been listening to a podcast recently which has been speaking about different dynasties and different empires. And what is always true is that an empire rises and then it falls. One empire rises and then another empire rises and that empire falls. And it, it is really so strange, isn't it, that these empires try to physically build all these things from slave labor. And then what happens is that is burnt down or that is torn down well, actually, metaphorically, but also physically, all their work is proved to actually not last. All their work is proved to ultimately be worthless. The labor that they use to build their own kingdom ends up in ruin. Because you see, God hates forced labor. We see that throughout the Bible. He, he, he teaches against the, the exploitation of humans because humans are made in God's image. Every single person in this world, because they're made in the image of God, has an innate value, which means that people should not be oppressed. Now, some people would say, and they would turn to the Bible, and they'd say, well, hang on, we do see this idea of slavery in the Bible. And they would question whether God is for slavery. But actually, we need to understand what's going on in the Bible, and what's going on in those times. You see, actually, God's people, they did have people that were called slaves. But that slavery is very different to the way that we would think about it today. That slavery was the idea of somebody willingly giving themselves to the service of a family, for example. Somebody who was willing to give their service in order to receive a fee. In some senses, how we would see maybe a butler or a maid today who is giving a service and has rights. And actually God is completely for the rights of these people. He is for the fair pay of these people. He's for their rights to be treated with dignity and respect. Actually we read in, in the law of God that there are opportunities even for those people to go free and for, those, for their debt to be wiped away. Because God is for people. He's not for this idea of slavery which we see. But the Babylonian Empire, well, they would want slaves who they wouldn't pay and who they'd work to the bone just so that they could build up their own empire. Babylon had used slave labor. They'd used slave labor and they would be judged for it. And God promises a world without slave labor. Verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the water covers a sea. The knowledge of the glory of God. Part of God's glory is that he loves all, all people and they're all created with dignity and worth. So as the world will one day be filled with the knowledge of his glory, it will be filled with all of the things that the Lord stands for. People created in his image who are all treated fairly and who are not oppressed. Is that not the world that we want? Is that not the world that we want? You see, we think of slave labor, though, interestingly, as just going on back then, right? Or maybe some of us, we think about the slave trade. But interestingly, and you'll hopefully start to see a theme here, although we think of our postmodern world as having moved on from slavery, slavery still exists today. One 16-year-old in this country said this last year, it's on your doorstep, you just don't see it. You see, it's actually really difficult for us to, to quite get numbers for what is happening in this country at the moment in terms of slave labor. But this year, there's been an increase in 9% of the potential child victims that have been referred. There's been 9,468 victims referred, and that is only victims that have been referred, not the actual figures. There are female victims of sexual exploitation. 
There are people that are exploited. There are cannabis har uh, harvesting. There's child begging. There's drug selling. Many of you will have heard of, of the idea of county lines, of young people who are taken into slavery, modern slavery, and are, who are exploited. And I think it goes without saying at this point, is just a, a point of, of application, really, that if, if you do suspect that any of that is going on, then please do go and speak to the police and come and speak to our church family so that we can support you. Because as a church, we should stand against exploitation, shouldn't we? And unfortunately, the reality is, is though we think that we are removed from that, it is still a reality in our world today. Slavery still takes place all over the world. Sweatshops used to produce cheap clothing for us to wear. Companies like Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, all accused of slave, slave labor. <coughs> Colton is, is a key material that's used to make uh, laptops and mobile phones. And actually what happens in particularly one country is that people receive a couple of dollars a day, yet executives get 3.3 billion pound payouts as they are exploited, as slavery is going on in our world, just so that we can have quicker laptops and phones with 20 cameras on the back of them. Some of the things that we are wearing and maybe even have in our hands are the result of exploitation. It's still going on in our world, but God promises a world without slave labor and judgment for those who have taken part in it. But Babylon is, is, is also called to account for their abuse of others. Woe for, woe to abusers. Look at verse 15. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You see, the Babylonians, they would, they would take over nations and they would humiliate them. They were literally known for using alcohol in, in these types of ways, but also it is a kind of picture of how they would humiliate and bring shame to the nations they conquered. And God hates this. He wants to bring justice against those who shame others. We see in the Bible from the very, very start that there is this example, some of you will know the story, of Noah. Of Noah getting drunk and one of his sons looking upon his shame and disgrace and doing nothing about it. And he is judged for that. And that is what God is saying here. That those who are abusive, those who shame others, those who look down upon them, they will be brought to judgment. Because as Babylon has brought shame to other nations that they have attacked, so one day the shame will be turned back on them. The Bible warns that actually there will be a cup that is poured out on Babylon. And the shame that they brought upon other nations, they will be made to drink themselves. And we see that in our world, don't we? Different examples both of literal countries and nations and organizations, but also of individuals who seek to shame others and abuse them. We long for justice, don't we? Even in the news this week, I was watching as, as some of our politicians in this country have been, have been called out for using alcohol and then abusing others. And we hate that, don't we? We don't want to live in a world where that, that is the norm and where that happens. We long that there might be justice. And God says there will be. He will turn Babylon's glory to shame. They want to get glory by shaming others because it makes them seem even bigger. But actually, as they have exposed their victims, he will expose them. This picture of this cup, it, it's used throughout the Bible to describe God's judgment. We wish for a future, don't we, where all abusers are brought to justice. Well, God pronounces this woe on abusers. He pronounces this woe on Babylon, and he promises justice. The final woe centers on who or what Babylon worships, though. Look down with me at verses 18 and onwards. Those who worship idols... Tim Keller says this, an idol is usually a good thing that we make ultimate. We say, unless I have that, I am nothing. An idol is something we look to for things that only God can give. You see, God commands people not to worship idols, but instead people turn to images and they worship them. And that is deeply offensive to God. 
Imagine that you have given birth to a child or, or fathered a child, your, your own flesh and blood, who is alive because of you, who actually exists because of your care for them, who actually relies on you completely. Imagine you, you get home from work. You've been working in order to provide for them. And as you walk into the door and expect to see your own flesh and blood, you actually notice that they don't even come and speak to you at all. Instead, what they hold in their hand is, is, is some kind of picture that they created of you, some kind of caricature. They've, they've kind of taken the things that they don't really like about you and they've changed it into the image that they'd like. And they've kind of, kind of drawn what you're kind of like and instead of coming and saying hello to you and greeting you and thanking you for the work that you've been doing in order to actually let them survive, they are looking at this picture adoringly saying, oh, I love you. I love you. I worship you. Thank you so much for all that you've done for me. They, they worship this, this image instead of the one who is there, who both created them and actually fulfills them and allows them to even exist. They've created this, this caricature which doesn't even represent who you are. And, and, then, and then they both turn from that caricature and they, and they turn to, to some of the gifts that you've given them. Some of the good gifts that you've given them throughout their life that they didn't deserve but you've just given to them. And yet again, they worship them. They say, oh, I love you, teddy bear. Or my iPhone. Or, or some kind of toy. You, you complete me. You give me everything I want. My life is just centered upon you. And, 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 you, and you're standing there and, and you think, well, this isn't right. Surely I need to, to discipline them in some way. So, so you go to, to take this good thing that you've given them away from them. And they snap at you. They say, I hate you. Go away. I don't want you. I want this gift that you've given me, but I don't want you. They turn from you and they turn back to this present that you've given them. And they are completely incensed by it. The idea that you could take it away. They want it for themselves. They want to worship it. And they want to worship the caricature that they have created of you. Well, in many ways, that is a small picture of idolatry. And it's utterly, utterly ridiculous, isn't it? Think about how you'd feel as somebody who has fathered or given birth to a child and who has provided for them, and yet they turn away from you. And yet that's what we do. Verse 18, For the one who makes it an idol trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, Come to life, or to a lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? You see, Babylon was an idol-worshipping idol nation. You see, instead of worshipping the living God, they'd make their own idols and they'd give them glory. But God won't share his glory with another. God won't share his glory with another because he alone deserves glory. And so he pronounces this judgment on Babylon. They were idol-worshippers, idol and yet God pronounces woe and judgment on them. And we might think we're beyond this, Right? 21st century, there's no way that we would have some little figurine, would we? We would never have something that we would carry around, that we would really, really care about, that we could, we could never really want to be without. We would never have something that we would, uh, would, would feed when it's hungry, that we, we would physically make sure that, that it, it was fed and had everything that it needed, something that we'd spend all our time looking at and poring over, Something that is, is a really good gift that God has given to us, but, but actually it, it centers upon us and, and we just want to be with it. And we, don't, we don't want God, we don't want the good giver, but we just want the thing that he's given to us. Something that we care for, something that, that if we think we lose, we start to worry and we freak out. Something that, that we can't even leave our house without. We surely don't have any idols in our life, right? Now I'm not saying get rid of your iPhone. Maybe you should. But I am saying we're quicker to worship idols than we think. 
You see, if it's not our phone, well, then it's our money or our clothes or our house or our possession. Or maybe it's things that aren't even physical, like our appearance or our reputation or sport. These are good things that God has given us. And yet, like that child turning away from the one that gave them life, we turn away from the gift giver and we hate the gift giver and we worship what has been given to us instead. And you know what the funny thing is? Is that actually, if we worship the giver, it would allow us to enjoy the gifts that he'd given us in an even greater, more fulfilling way. Babylon was an idol-worshipping nation, and so they were going to be judged. And in all of this, we get right to the end of this passage. Well done, we've got through all five woes. And we see that God is on the throne. Verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. You see, he's the one who pronounces judgment on sin because he is perfect and he has the right to judge. There's no other judge who has the right to judge, is there? Because all human judges fail and are sinful and can be exploited, but God can't be exploited. And we should be glad that God pronounces woe on sin because we see how terrible sin is, right? Right? Which of us, hands up, wants to live in a world of exploitation, of slavery, of idol worship, of abuse? I hope no hands go up. If not, we'll maybe have to have a conversation after this. We don't want to live in a world like that, do we? We want justice, and God promises it. But you see, there is a problem in all of this. There is a problem that we need to remember. You see... Although the Babylonians were doing all this, God did raise them up. And that, that can create some kind of conflict in our mind, can't it? But actually, God is good and holy and is not responsible for sin. And although he raised up the Babylonians, he has the right to do that. God alone has the right to discipline his people. He raised up the Babylonians in many senses to show his people that they needed to turn back to him. It was his shout and his plea to them to see that this world isn't all there is and to turn back. But God is not guilty of sin in that. But when we think about Babylon... When we think of the woes that are pronounced and the judgment that God calls, there is a glaring and obvious problem that hopefully you've seen as we've gone through each of these woes. That actually, even though we agree with the fact that the sin of the Babylonians was terrible, as we've seen time and time and again for each woe, it applies to our world today. And not only that, it applies to us. You see, you might not have a slave at home. You might not be building your own Burj Khalifa in your back garden. Good luck if you're trying to build it. But all of us are guilty in different ways, aren't we? All of us have our idols. All of us have turned to the good giver and we have said, oh, I don't want you, but I want your gifts. I want to worship this caricature of you. I want to repaint you into the way that, that I see, into a way where actually I can, I can rub out all the things that I don't really like about you and I can change them. We've all turned against God and we are guilty. And you see, actually, the Bible talks about Babylon both literally but also figuratively. Literally and figuratively. You see, there was a Babylon that was a nation and it was a historical nation that turned against God and was guilty for all these things. But the Bible also uses it as a picture of all those who turn against God. We see that most clearly in Revelation 17 to 19. Well, actually, God paints that there are two sides. There are God's people and there is Babylon. And Babylon must fall because all evil and all sin must be dealt with. We want that, don't we? We want a world where there is justice, where those people who broke into that house in Liverpool and shot that little girl dead pay for the crimes that they have committed. But the problem is, is that as much as we want that justice, actually that justice must also fall on us. And we are guilty. You see, actually Babylon is used in terms of all those people that turn away from God, but we live in Babylon, right? This great city of London in many ways is Babylon. It is a sinful and a perverse city. Yes, there is some common grace extended to it, but it is a sinful and a perverse city, and it will one day be judged just like Babylon, and it might even fall. 
just like Babylon. We need a way of escape. You see, God talks about his judgment and he describes it as a cup in verse 16. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will become your glory. You see, we deserve this cup because we've turned away from the good giver. We deserve these woes and this punishment. But there was one who came for us. There was one who became a man like us and lived a perfect life. There was one who was completely and utterly innocent and yet went onto the cross to drink the cup of God's wrath. Who drunk the cup of this judgment. Who actually even spoke about this and said that they were going to drink this cup for guilty sinners. The Lord Jesus came to earth and he drunk the cup of God's judgment. So that we, through the gospel and through the death and the resurrection of Lord Jesus, can be saved. And so that we might not have these woes pronounced on us, but actually instead that they would fall on him. And it's a free gift that's given to us. And it is an opportunity for us to escape that judgment and to one day have a world in which there is no injustice and no evil and no sin because Babylon will fall. You see, actually, Babylon has to fall and it is a good thing. Yes, we're not, we're not happy necessarily that people are going to go to hell and that God will tear down nations and will call them to account. But we are happy that justice will happen, right? Right? Because justice needs to happen. We cry out for it. But the good news and the good, the, the good kind of news for us that Babylon is going to fall is because actually the fact that Babylon is going to fall is that there is a new city that is going to take its place. The holy city the new Jerusalem, the bride that is coming down, loved by the Lord Jesus. You see, one day there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And no longer will Babylon reign. No longer will this world have sin and injustice and exploitation and slavery and abuse. But instead, God will make everything new. And the hope for us is that although we do not deserve in any sense, in any form, to be in that new perfect city, we can be there through the blood of the Lord Jesus. We can be there. And I think there's a couple of applica applica application? application points. Just to finish, if we're a Christian here this morning, then we need to flee Babylon. Revelation 18 verse 4 says this, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, or maybe share in her woes. You see, as Christians, yes, we cannot remove ourselves from the world that we are in because we live in a sinful world, but we must not become like them. We must see the woes that are pronounced on them, and we must seek to not live as they live, but instead live for the Lord Jesus. We must come out of Babylon. So we must flee Babylon, but we also must flee to Christ. We must remember that as Christians we have given our life to him, that he has drunk the cup of God's judgment and we must praise him for it. That should be our oxygen, it should be our blood, it should be the thing that we return to in the gospel because the gospel is the greatest news, right? That instead of us having to drink that cup of judgment, Jesus has already drunk it for us. And that will always be the only motivation to help us flee from Babylon and not live a life of sin. So let's flee Babylon and let's flee to Christ. But finally, if you're not a Christian, well, then you need to answer this question. Are you living in Babylon? Or are you going to flee to Christ? You see, you need to answer this question. When one day you stand before God, will he pronounce woe on you? Or will he turn and say that you are living for the Lord Jesus? You see, if you think that you can get to heaven and you can present some kind of CV to God of all the good things that you've done and that you'll give him that and he'll be like, oh, great, you seem like a really nice guy. Come through to heaven. Then you're seriously mistaken. Because actually, for all of those good things that actually probably aren't even that good, there is our evil and our sin and our rejection of the good giver. And unless, unless... You have given your life to Christ and have accepted that he has drunk the cup of God's wrath and his judgment. Then you will not have eternity with him. And what he will give you is he will give you a world of injustice and a world of slavery and a world of abuse 
and a world of exploitation. That is what hell is. It is all those things because it is a world in which God has given his judgment and has poured out his woes. So I plead with you, escape Babylon. Flee from Babylon, but flee to Christ. Because if you turn to him, if you say thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking the cup of God's judgment that I deserved, but thank you for taking it upon yourself, then you can know that you can be saved. You can flee from Babylon. You can get out the city. There was, in Pilgrim's Progress, there's a point in which, which I speak about all the time, but it's just because it's a great book. There's a character called Christian who's in the city of destruction. He's in Babylon. He has this burden on his back, just like Habakkuk in many ways, that he sees the world out there, but he also looks around him and sees sin. And yet he flees the city. He flees the city. And where does he go? He goes to the cross. If you want to flee the city, then go to the cross and the one who took on the cup of God's judgment for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, in many, many senses, we can come to it and wonder how it applies to us, things that were written so long ago in times so different than ours, and yet we see that it still applies today. Lord, I pray that we would see the evil and the sin in our world and the woe that you have pronounced on evil. And that, Lord, if we are not walking with you, that we would flee from Babylon and turn to you. And for us who have fled Babylon, help us to continue to come out of her. Help us to live a life that is honouring to you. Help us ultimately to give you glory for the fact that the Lord Jesus took the cup of your judgment. In Jesus' name.